Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. I'm Francis Seeley from Global Net 21, and Enfield Voices and a local group called NCAP, Enfield Climate Action Forum. And this is one of the webinars we're doing in the Big Green Climate Festival Week that it comes under the Climate Coalition, where they're looking at the, the emergency of climate change prior to COP26, the meeting of world leaders. And today we're going to look at green businesses and how one person in his company have put sustainability and reducing the carbon footprint at the center of what they do. Obviously, they've got to make money like all companies, but they put at the center of what they do, the importance of the sustainability. And they see that as the future of the way all companies must go. And we've got Anthony Fisher, who founded Keller, and I hope I pronounced it right this time, um, who is going to talk to us, and Mario Elia, who deals with some of the marketing side of the company as well. So maybe I could start, Anthony, if I could ask you briefly to tell us something about your, yourself and your background. Yes, this is a brief answer. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Francis, for asking us to participate in this. I started um, out life as a medical student at University College Hospital, but I soon realized that I didn't have the memory or the passion to be a doctor, so I left. And fortunately, there was a position available as a laboratory technician in a company that was just beginning to manufacture. So I joined Enfield Technical College and studied um, part-time there whilst I worked at the company and fortunately I discovered I enjoyed the industry so it, it's taken me from Los Angeles through to Tokyo in my lifetime inside almost every business I like it I have a butterfly brain which means I challenge everything and it enabled me to develop into a reasonable research and development chemistry for the industry. Okay and Mario how did you get involved in, in the company? It's quite, a, it's quite a funny story. I'd actually never worked with chemicals before. It was, um, it was like my first, second job off university and I applied for the company, got the role and it's been great ever since then. Um, especially seeing how it's developed, even in the two years I've been here, I've seen so much change, even with sustainability as much as in other things. Okay, so Anthony, you believe I know that sustainability in business can and should go hand in hand. But that's not the case with a lot of businesses, is it? Well, we're lucky in as much that nowadays our customers, on the whole, want more sustainable products. They primarily work on reducing their carbon footprint. So there is customer interest. I remember about 15 years ago, we had a project with the Middlesex University, which was then in Enfield, on finding out from our customers what they wanted with regard to environmentally responsible products. And absolutely no one was interested. So we had to switch the project to looking at other new suppliers of more sustainable raw materials. So we're lucky that nowadays our, our customers are interested. But that isn't always the case. Not every company can say that. We're lucky that with the raw materials cost being expensive but reasonable we can produce products which what customers want at a reasonable price well, you, you 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 say that's what you do but we haven't really told people what you do yet oh yes so maybe, maybe maybe you could tell us a bit about keller what it is and what its core business is why it's, sorry why it's what it, what your core business is oh my core business sorry yes a core business is the manufacturer supply of cleaning and maintenance chemicals to industry. We're a business to business company. Kayla's focus with our own brand is to the mass transit industry. That's buses, trains, trams, the underground, anything to do with the mass transit of people. And you have sustainability in the heart of what you do, don't you? Um, I mean, how have you done that as you've developed your business? Well, it's, it's, but per my personal effort and also the effort of the research team, we have three directors who are scientists. Um, we have three people in the laboratory and we, our research focus always bears sustainability in mind now because of the, the um, request of our customers and the demand of our customers, but also our, this is what our desire is. We, we want to um, be a future a company 
for the future, not one for now. And the future is sustainability. So we need to work now to slowly build up a, a, what I hope one day will be everything we sell is sustainable and allows for a lower carbon footprint. It must be a real difficult job for you. And maybe it's not, Mario, when you have to go to companies that are in the mass transit market, which can sometimes be a very dirty business and tell them it's possible to be green. I mean, how do you how do you do that? I'm quite fortunate in the sense that we've got uh, I've got a lot of experience at my hand with my colleagues, especially Anthony. Um, he's got even you were telling me Anthony from even the 1970s you were trying to develop super concentrates that even though the customers not might not know their, what the products are or that the alternative is available, but the what our company is good at is influencing them and kind of just slightly suggesting better ways. Anthony, do you want to answer that from your super concentrate perspective? Yes, I was fortunate. My first job, I spent 20 years with a company where we're manufacturing aviation cleaners under license to an American company. And I was part of a cleaning group. So I was able to go on site to where cleaning was taking place, talk to the cleaners and actually see firsthand what the problems were. And that gave me an insight into what cleaners themselves, what, the, what their personal problems were and what, what was needed. The Americans taught me sophisticated raw materials because at, at that time, England was depending on caustic, metasilicate, tea pole, very crude and soap, very crude and simple products. Whereas in America, the technology for chemical specialities was developing at full pace. Now Europe is better than America, but in those days, the Americans led the way. So that's introduced me to the concept, do not be afraid to use different raw materials. Don't, don't be tied to tradition all the time, look to the future. So how did you go from having that idea to turning it into an actual reality? What, the company or? or yeah, the, the company. Well, I, I, I think I'm, it must be difficult to employ because I felt the employers weren't treating me very well. So I thought the only way to solve that was to start the business, which I did in um, February 1988. Um, and in those days, of course, I did everything. I was, I was a scientist, the salesperson, the mixer, the invoice. So I was able to do everything in my head and no one, no one would say no to me. So I was able to set the ethos of the company at an early stage, which was to give good service to customers and to have products as efficient as, is, as possible and not to sell a lot of dirty chemicals. For instance, drain cleaning used to be done using dichlorobenzene, which is a very noxious substance. Nowadays, we'd use um, bacteria for the same purpose. So move away from these rather traditional, old-fashioned, dangerous chemicals into what were becoming the new ones, which always excited me. So I said earlier, I have a butterfly brain. I like to do things in a new way. I'm never happy with what it, the status quo is. I want to change it. I mean, so, I mean, when you decided to do your own business um, and you developed all the biogradable things that you do and so on, was that something that inspired you or was it the business that inspired you? And did you develop the things that are sustainable by accident? Because, you know, lots of people, lots of things are developed by accident. The paper blue stick-ons where the glue on that was discovered by accident by Art Fry. But you didn't discover it by accident, did it? It was something that you wanted to do. Is that right? Yeah, so I, no, the business is built up. And I'm very pleased with where we are now. But I have to admit, I'm not motivated by money or business side. I'm, I'm motivated by technical ex excellence, technical integrity. I want, I like solving problems. And, and I see a, a cleaning issue as an opportunity to create a new product. Um, and I love it when something comes along and I've not seen it before. We can solve the problem and, and have a new product for it. And, and of course, nowadays, with, with the uh, palette of raw materials available to us, the techniques which are available to, for us, we, we can, from the beginning, create sustainable products. 
it's, you know, and for me at my age, I'm 78, the raw materials coming through, I've not seen before. So I've got the opportunity to learn about, along with my colleagues, to learn about new re, um, raw materials, which keeps me young, I hope. Well, it certainly seems to. And, um, you know, the, the way forward, do you think, in the future is, is to have companies that don't think of making money just, but also think of developing a good idea that is, you know, um, suitable for planetary survival. Yes, I feel strongly about this. We don't, you mustn't be naive and, and think everything's love and flowers like it was in the 60s. We, to survive, to pay your own wages, to pay the mortgage, to pay staff, you've got to make money. But I don't think that should be the goal of business. I think the business should integrate into society and be a responsible men, member of society as an entity, as well as, as the individuals, because we, we are made up of ordinary people. It's like every, every social structure is, is ordinary people. And, and we want to, to extend that into into the world, so, so to speak, this is a bit of philosophy, I suppose, that we want the company to reflect the people in, who are employed within it, and the people employed within the company are just like everyone else. Yeah, I mean, I certainly remember my flare trousers of the 60s, and <laughs> we all had those, but um, I mean, those ideas of the 60s now by people of your age and my age are, are really about how do we apply that aspiration in real terms, aren't they? And that, that's what you've done. Yes, you, you need experience, which is important, and scientific, in our area, scientific education to apply science to, to create what's wanted. It, it doesn't happen by accident. So I remember the first products were made, they were done in, I was mixing in the kitchen with adding salt and water to tea bowl to make it thicker. All very simple, basic stuff. Nowadays, it, it's, it's far more sophisticated than that. So um, I'm drifting away now, I realise, but it is important that experts, I hate this idea when one of the politicians said, who trusts experts? We don't need experts. We need more experts now than ever before. People who understand what's going on. And as long as um, we can all maintain the same sort of social integrity, we'll move in the right direction, being, being constructive, not destructive. Yeah, so, no, no. so, I mean, I, I agree. We need, we need experts to do the research, especially. And I mean, that's something that you feel strongly about what you've done in your company, isn't it? It's not just someone that, it's not a company that just produces things. You really do the research beforehand. And that's very important. Yes, well, as I said, we have three directors who are scientists. We have two laboratories um, staffed by three people who are, who are also expert in their field. And, and we, we, for a small company, that employed 25 people, we devote a huge amount of time to developing research and customer service, which is, goes along with research, is uh, helping customers solve their own problems and use existing products. We don't only keep developing new products, but to help customers use our products in a more efficient way to solve problems. Although I, I don't ever want to stop developing new pro products. Uh, that's when I go into my box, but, but it's... Um, important to make efficient use of what you have and, and use your brains, think about it all the time. Is that important for you, Mario, when you, you go out and market that you have that substantial research behind you so that you've got a lot of substance in what you're talking about? Yeah, definitely. I think that it's one of the points that differentiates us from any other, any other company. I think the lab's a big part of it because as well as what they do we've also got the expertise if the customers have any questions if they've got any concerns if they want to find you know, another uh, useful product or way to develop it we can do that okay well let, let's look Anthony at some of the things you actually do so people know a bit more about your company I mean one of the things you developed isn't it is super concentrates which cuts down on water use and that's important especially it would be important in, in times of climate change um, how did you go about that is that something you were looking to do how can I cut down on water um, or did that just come from the product you, you, you sort of discovered in your research well, as Mario alluded to earlier, in the late 70s, when I was working for this large group, I, I looked at 
the fact they were using 30 tonnes a month for the general cleaner we were making, quite a sophisticated blend. And I was listening to the supervisors complaining about stock control, and I thought, well, if I concentrate a bit, it'd make, it, it would save on um, not on raw materials, because concentrate means you use the same amount, but it cuts down on transport and storage, makes life more efficient for the supervisors. They could carry some around in their car. And I calculated I could reduce it from 30 to eight tonnes a month, which is what happened. My sums were accurate. So I've always had this thought that concentrates are better because uh, you can carry a small amount in your car if you're a supervisor. So if someone rungs out, you've got it there. It doesn't take up much space in the, in the store. There's not, not so much transport, obviously, you're not carting water about. Um, and at, at the same time, which you haven't um, um, mentioned, is the, is the fact that if you use one product instead of two, you automatically use less chemical. And that's why a lot of um, sales chemical sales companies would tell their salespeople, you know, if a customer wants one product, sell him two or three, that way they will use more. Um, and so I, I feel very strongly that we should preach cutting down the absolute number of chemicals used. Um, and we're developing a new range, which are very heavily sustainable. And the focus will be on just one or two products, which can be used for many things. That is as in um, as is important. Uh, but you also look at trying to produce products that are bio biodegradable, don't you? Um, not just the concentrates, but they, you, you want them to break down. You don't want them to be there as waste forever. How did you go about doing that? Well, nowadays, as I was discussing with Mario earlier, it's actually very difficult to buy non-biodegradable raw materials. And I would say that most people in our industry um, use biodegradable raw materials because because of the pressure of legislation, they are biodegradable. So although in the early days I did it by choose, choice because that's what I wanted, I, I would actively look for biodegradable chemicals, um, Nowadays, as I say, it's very difficult to buy, try and find something which isn't biodegradable. The choice is enormous. So I can't, I wouldn't say that that was a great issue at the moment. It's, it's more important to be sustainable and it's more important to work on the carbon footprint because the bio, bi, biodegradability issue has largely been solved from the point of view of raw materials. I mean, you say sustainable and carbon footprint, and I guess you mean by that the same thing. Um, do you go about measuring the carbon footprint of what you do and the, the companies you work with as well? The, the actual measurement is, is done by our larger customers. It's quite interesting. When, when we tender, and, and each year we have a review of, of how we performed in the previous year, and the bigger customers, almost without exception, are working on to reduce their carbon footprint. And a lot of what we offer um, goes towards that. So the actual scientific measurement is done by our customers, not by us. And, and um, it's interesting that it's becoming so important in, in the customer's business plan to be cut down on the carbon footprint. I would argue that sustainability and the carbon footprint are, are really different. They might end up as the same thing, but being sustainable, you need to have buy raw materials which don't contribute to the carbon footprint. You know, in other words, in the essence, it means you're not using oil-based materials. So although they probably are very similar, they're not quite the same. And I think it's important to differentiate between the two for clarity of development and thought. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you about that, so I'm pleased you made that distinction. But when you talk about reducing your carbon footprint in your business and so on, it's not just on um, the products you produce, is it? I mean, it's in your total environment, for example. You use boxes that are made from recycled material and so on. How important do you think it is for a company to look at sustainability or lowering your carbon footprint in its total environment and not just on one or two things? Well, there's two answers to that question. One is for the good of everyone else. 
it's important that all of us work towards becoming more sustainable, reducing our carbon footprint. So um, that's the philosophy. But also I believe in the future that those that don't won't be in existence because they'll be legislated out of existence. So, so it, it's important that the, the governments have got to play a part in this to, to produce an, um, a level playing field. So we're all playing by the same rules, but that doesn't mean to say individual companies can't um, be involved in the future. You know, working, we, we, we believe in, in a sustainable future. We believe in reducing the carbon footprint. That doesn't mean to say we always know the best way to go about doing it. We, of course we don't, no one does, but we do our best to um, contribute towards that. And you're right, packaging is perhaps one of the most important things. Uh, it, it's, it's been very difficult to buy plastic bottles made of recycled plastic. One of our suppliers has started doing that and we're looking at it. Re recycled cardboard has always been available. And, um, and of course, by using concentrates, you actually cut down dramatically on the amount of um, packaging you, you, you use. And also the idea of using re reusable bottles. So some applications, you need a small bottle. So rather than sell the customer the product in a small bottle, sell them a big one, which they can then dispense into small ones, which they keep reusing. So it, it, it's, it's training and, and working with the goodwill of the customer and the goodwill on our part. So, I mean, there's no enforcement yet through legislation. So when you work with companies, um, you don't work with anyone, do you? You try to ensure that they also want to genuinely be green and sustainable, don't you? And tell us about how you do that. Well, with regard to suppliers, we have choice and we choose to work with suppliers that we believe offer responsible products. With regard to customers, we guide them. We can't tell our customers what to do. And so we work by nudging them and working with them to try and encourage a more responsible attitude to sustainability and the carbon footprint. If someone came to us, a customer came and asked us to do something which was outrageous, then we would not do it. But most of the time, in most, most customers, I must be careful here because I don't want to upset my customers. <laughs> One of the things which has dramatically changed since I started is that nowadays people actually want things to be clean. And the customers understand the cleaning technology. At one time, they didn't. The old British Rail, for instance, um, they didn't care whether the trains were clean or not. They, they ticked boxes and, you know, you and I can remember what they used to be like. It's because people weren't interested. And cleaning companies very often didn't care. They used to call it jollop, which offends me. It's not jollop. They're very scientifically, <laughs> cleverly conceived products. Um, so there's, a, there's an increasing awareness of cleaning technology, the importance of science, the importance of training, the importance of technique, the importance of practice. So I've drifted away from my point. So nowadays, I think that we don't have to guide or train our customers as much as I had to, because they actually understand what needs to be done. I mean, can you give us an example of, say, one company you work with where you sort of engaged in the process you just talked about? Yes, was well, Accordant, for instance, who, who, who are a clean company who specialise in cleaning mass transit, um, buses, trains, etc. And, and we, they're one of the early convents, converts to concentrates. So we supply them with concentrates. We've trained them in the use of uh, DEMA dispensing units, which are a whole range, more or less sophistication. We produced training guides, which Mario turned into posters, which are put on acrylic, which are put on the wall. So the cleaners know how to use the equipment. They know what dilutions to use for what application. And we make sure that they have the containers that they can use the product from. So, so that, that was a very successful exercise because the company wanted it. They weren't quite sure how to go about it, because that's our job. We're, they're expert in doing the cleaning. We're expert in 
producing the system to the products. And I'm, I'm very proud of that, the fact that the concentrates were very effectively and efficiently used. I mean, what's interesting to me about that is you don't just sell, you train as well and you bring people along. Is that a part of your role, Mario, in terms of marketing that you also market, if you like, a training package that goes with it? Yes, yeah, so a big part of what I do is working with the sales team and making sure their client, they have what they need to fulfill their client needs. And a big part of that has been producing training manuals, even as simple as making them posters to reuse a trigger head instead of putting it in the recycling or in the rubbish. So yeah, that's a big part of my role. Yeah, well, that, that, that's quite interesting that you're actually providing a sort of total environment and framework in which they can work. Um, I mean, but when you're working with companies, some of them may say to you, yeah, we want to work with you because we really want to be green, but basically they're greenwash companies. How do you distinguish between the ones who are authentic that you work with, Anthony, and those that are not? Well, this is something which civil servants don't like. It's judgment. Um, it, it's, I, I've been in this industry since 1964. Our managing director has been in it for probably 30 years. Um, yes, yeah, 30 years. It's experience. We, we learn to read the signs. Um, we can look at data produced and we know what's genuine, what isn't genuine. So it's, ex, it's experience. And although I personally believe what I'm told, until I've seen that it's not true. Um, you can make judgment on, on, I'm talking about suppliers now, you can just make judgment on what's been offered. And, and nowadays, because of, um, I suppose, the marketing departments, big companies tend to tell the truth about things. It hasn't, in our industry, it hasn't always been the case, and we're not naive, but the, the quality of the information coming through from suppliers is pretty good nowadays. It's a lot. They're having to teach people like us how to use the new raw materials because they know that the old ones won't be around much more because big companies, look they do look ahead. They're meeting groups and they know what's going to happen in 30 years' time. I don't because I'm not involved in that. So, so they're, they're offering us raw materials now knowing that a lot of the common one, current ones won't be available. They don't want to tell me that because they don't want to stop me using them. So it's our choice to use the, the proper ones. Um, the point I made earlier, what I wanted to make earlier, one of our very big chemical <coughs> distributors, that they, they supply us raw materials from all over. I just happened to be in the office and I met and started talking to them. He said he likes coming to see us because we are the only one of his customers in England that do research. He said most people base their, what they make on products made in the 90, developed in the 1970s, which is when chemical specialities really took off in the UK. Now, I don't know how true that statement is, but I was, I was surprised because I've always assumed that doing what we, we do, you have to do research. You have to be good. But apparently we, that isn't the case. I mean, that combination of uh, research and training and marketing is a really powerful combination. So do companies ever come to you to get advice about how they find people who are genuinely green and how, about, how they go about working with them? Can you provide that sort of advice to others as well as do the business you do yourself? It's always difficult here where I'm torn. I like to help people, but I don't want to help my competitors too much. Um, so I, I think this is one of the points I was actually, I was wondering how we'd get it in. I think there could be much more cooperation in the industry that we, manufacturing industry. Um, I really talk to my competitors. I don't know what they're thinking. They don't know what I'm thinking. And I think it would be useful if we did meet and discuss things in general terms. We never asked, well, once I was asked, when Conquer was being built, I was asked to develop a cleaner for it. Um, but we're never asked by people who make buildings, surfaces to be clean or equipment. We're never asked, is this the best way to manufacture something so it can be easily maintained? And I think there should be far more 
dialogue before between all parties. Um, cleaning our, our customers are cleaning companies now are talking to us, asking us what's the best way to do this for training. But when it comes to the equipment and the buildings they're cleaning, that doesn't doesn't happen. And to so say the the um, our competitors, yes, I would like to talk to our competitors, but I doubt big ones probably think, well, they're only a small company. Why should we take any notice of them? <laughs> no, that happens. Well, I mean, they should, because what you do is, is quite incredible in a way. But that model you talk about of not having cutthroat competition, but having collaborative competition is a really good model that I think may, many people should follow. And maybe in the 21st century, they should. And their prosperity may depend upon it. And do you think it does? And do you think prosperity in the future depends upon sustainable products being used rather than going down the line of waste and um, planned obsolescence and that we've got to go that way in the future because it's not only right for the planet businesses won't survive if they don't do it i think it's inevitable that businesses have got to walk along the road of sustainability because if they don't change they will be forced to change by legislation and by customers insisting um, and as customers become more educated, it's too, it's too easy for salespeople to, to confuse a customer, to fuse, confuse anyone, to confuse me, about to make the wrong decision, be out of ignorance. And I think people, as people become more educated and understanding in whatever it is, whatever market it is, it's going to become more difficult for companies to mislead people. So I think that the, the, the path for the future is exactly what you say. It's collaboration. It's being honest. Um, and that will be forced upon us by, by, by no, not only by legislation, but by, by customers, definitely. Um, OK, well, we sort of got very close to the end of our half hour now. Um, so, Mario, let me ask you, I mean, if people wanted to find out more about what you do and you're the marketing man, they wanted to find out more about what you do and get in touch with you, where would they go? What would they do? Just visit our website. We've got a contact page, we've got a live chat page. I'll be on the other end of that. So any questions, just come to me. So they can come to you. OK, that's great. And Anthony, um, what about you? Have you sort of retired? Are you still in the company? I know you do lots of other things, uh, finger and many pies, Enfield poets, you're very involved in. Um, are you living a retired life? Are you still working uh, with as many butterfly ideas that you've always done? Yes, I mean, I'm fortunate that as it's um, I own over 50% of the company, I can't, say, I'll, I can't be sacked, which is lovely. But um, yes, I enjoy it. And as, as long as I feel I can contribute, I want to be involved. I would hate it if I would become a, a nuisance and, and a burden on the company. But we have a good team. We meet and discuss things. And I very much enjoy developing new ideas. I enjoy hearing from Mario and our sales director on what's going on in the field. And um, I enjoy, as I said earlier, seeing what new raw materials are coming along. So uh, I just enjoy it and I feel that I contribute. I hope I recognize a time when I no longer contribute. That's when I'll step back. Oh, I, I would think you'll probably contribute for a long time because you have that enthusiasm and, and desire to make a difference. And I think that's what keeps us all alive when we have that. And that's really important. Um, this is, you know, uh, in the big green climate festival week, which is coming up now which is really, really important. And it's important for people to be green, whether they're in civil society, whether they're in government, local or national, and whether they're in business. And clearly you've set a, a, a great example. I mean, none of us are paradigms of virtue. None of us do it perfectly. But what you do is try to do it and you endeavor to do it. And many other companies are beginning to do that. And companies like yours, um, which don't always get it perfect, but try as much as they can to be green and sustainable are really important role models for us all. So thank you for joining us today and we'll end this interview now.